were when the ice storm happened in 2013? If you weren't here, imagine waking up to a city coated in ice. The tree branches were hauntingly beautiful, shimmering while making a nerve-wracking creaking sound. We'd woken up to our cold house with no power and the temperature was dropping quickly. Outside, there were fallen tree branches and hydro lines in the street. And our neighbors were slowly emerging. Gathering on the sidewalk, we figured out that the power was only out to half the street. So people offered up their homes to warm up and take hot showers. It took about 30 hours to get the power back on and to get back to life as normal. But it got me thinking about our vulnerability and how lucky we were to have the neighbors that we did. I chose architecture as my path at the age of 17. School challenged me to think about things like building science, the beauty of design, and the social philosophies of living. I struggled to balance my left brain logical self with my right brain creative that they were calling. Year after year, I worked hard to keep up, and year after year, I persisted and eventually graduated. Two years into practice, I took a year off to study Zen Shiatsu therapy. The next logical step for an architect, right? <laughs> it was taught much like a martial art, the breaking down of the ego, the endless push-ups and sit-ups. But as a healing art, we were called to connect with the people that we were working with, to hold the space for them. Now, my tendency as a type A was to precisely locate the pressure points and hold them for exactly the right amount of time. But my sensei was on to me, and uh, he would tease me, make me wear, wear a blindfold, and he'd say, Michelle, how are you gonna find the points? Did you bring your drawings? Inadvertently, he taught me to listen with my whole body, with all of my senses, and it changed the way I think about architecture. And these days, I spend my days thinking about buildings and how people live in them. During my days in Shiatsu, I got to figure out that most people don't actually think about buildings. But what most people need and crave is connection. And in this time when change seems to be accelerating exponentially, it's these connections to one another that will ground us. And architecture provides opportunities for people to connect. So on the morning of the ice storm, the big change that brought us out there, climate change. It's big and scary, and though we're all talking about it, none of us really wants to think too hard about it. But the climate has changed, and the climate is changing. Going forward, we need to not just mitigate future changes to our climate, but we need to work together to adapt and to plan for the changes to come. What if I told you that buildings were one of the keys to both mitigating and adapting to climate change, and that connecting with people in your communities was the other, the other key? To mitigate climate change, we need to cut our emissions, in, in, our emissions from fossil fuels in half by 2030. In this city, buildings account for 52% of our greenhouse gas emissions, and globally, they account for 40% that makes them both the largest contributor and the key solution to mitigating climate change. Now, we know how to build low-carbon buildings, and some people are actually doing it. What really worries me is that that's the exception, not the norm in my industry today. The real estate market focuses on selling us a lifestyle, so people romanticize living in glass buildings with expansive views. And glass buildings, we know how to build them. We've been doing it a really long time. But the thing is, when you live in a place where the temperature varies by 60 degrees Celsius over the course of a year, glass boxes do very little to keep us comfortable without blasting heating or air conditioning. And nobody's talking about that. No discussions are taking place in sales centers about how a building will perform or how it'll function in case of a power failure. Imagine if you could look at a label on a building and understand its carbon impact just as easily as reading a food label. Buildings emit carbon in two ways. There's the emissions 
from the, from the materials to build them, which is called embodied carbon. There's the emissions from the fuels needed to operate the building, or operational carbon. To reduce the embodied carbon, we need to use materials that are adaptable and durable and have the lowest possible footprint. Now, concrete is probably the most common material we use to build large buildings. It has a very high embodied carbon. Wood, on the other hand, is the only structural material that actually sequesters carbon. And we're just completing the first timber office building to be constructed in this province in a century because our codes and standards have allowed us to do this, finally. Now, to reduce our operational carbon, we have to reduce our reliance on the fossil fuels needed to heat, cool, and ventilate them. And therein, the solution is in design. So orienting and shaping the building to invite in natural light and to hold out the heat that we don't want. Well-insulated walls, right-sized windows that actually open. These kind of passive design solutions, they're really quite simple. But what they do is they allow a building to keep us warm when it's cold and cool when it's hot, with or without air conditioning. Now, when we design buildings, we build several models to understand how a building will behave based on weather data. Temperature, rain, wind, snow. These weather inputs are all based on historical data. That's how we've always done it, and that's how our codes and standards require that we do it. Now, Studies have been done to predict what the weather outcomes will be for most major cities based on climate change. We should be using all available data to model our buildings now so that they're resilient for the future. While we cannot predict exactly what weather is to come, what we do know is modeling to historical data is no longer enough. And at this point, action is more important than perfection. You know that feeling of buying a brand new cell phone only to have the newer model be released a week later? That's what it feels like to be building buildings based on historical data. Now, we watched as the youth took to the street for the World Climate March last month, and they showed us what they valued. These are the future residents of the buildings that we are designing today, and they've shown us that building to a code minimum is just not good enough anymore, because these buildings will not have value in the future. So on October 20th, 2019, Canadian architects across the country signed a declaration committing to the urgent and sustained action to combat climate change. Step one. Now we have some work to do. Now I told you, that buildings were one of the solutions to both mitigating and adapting to climate change, and that the other key was connecting to people in your community. So let me tell you what happened in Chicago. In 1995, a massive heat wave hit Chicago, and 739 people died in just five days. It's horrifying, right? So a sociologist named Eric Kleinenberg has done extensive research on this heat wave. And he's connected to a concept called Social, social infrastructure. Yes, that's what it is, social infrastructure. And social infrastructure is about our shared spaces. So this is things like community centers and libraries, but it's also sidewalks and grocery stores, parks. So according to his research, what he, de what he determined was that socially vulnerable and economically vulnerable people had a much higher mortality rate than those white economically advantaged ones. So this is going to be no surprise to any of us. But where things got truly interesting was when he identified two neighborhoods side by side that had exactly the same statistical markers to say that the death toll should have been high. But one of these two neighborhoods fared better than all the rest. It had a lower mortality rate than even the most economically advantaged. And, and the question was why? So what he figured out in his research was that this particular community had an incredibly strong social infrastructure. Its sidewalks and buildings were really well looked after. It had active, engaged community groups. There were places to gather, places for people to run into each other, like shopping areas and parks. So there was a depth to the connection that people had within the community. So when the, when the heat wave hit, instead of staying in their overheated, unair-conditioned apartments, they gathered in their shared spaces. They gathered, they strategized, they looked around, they noticed who was missing, and then they knocked on their doors. 
And so it was this reaching out, it was these factors that allowed this community to cope, thrive, and, and, and adapt during this time of change. So communities are made up of people and systems that are connected and interdependent. And to create a resilient community, we must understand and deepen this interconnection. We must be inclusive and provide overlap so that if one link breaks, it's barely felt by the whole. Connected communities are resilient communities, and resilience is really what we need in this time of accelerating change. The morning of the ice storm, it was my neighbors that gathered on the sidewalk. We got together, we figured it out. We'd somehow gotten to know each other. We'd built a network over time through chance encounters in our shared spaces. And thoughtful design allows room for that, allows room for people to be both public and private, as well as those in-between spaces that allow for casual encounter. It's that well-placed low wall that provides the perfect place to sit and take a rest. It's, it's like the distance between the porch and the sidewalk that's you know, far enough away for me to have privacy, but close enough for me to talk to you. And uh, that is the subtle beauty of design and its ability to connect us and build community. And so not even knowing any of you here, I would imagine you all live in existing buildings. And chances are at some point in your life, you'll live in a new building. And that makes you all uniquely qualified to understand what needs to change in the buildings that you live in. You know what kind of things happened last time during the last climate event. And so I ask you, what are you going to do to prepare for next time? As my sensei taught me, connection to one another is what we all crave. And connection is what we need to build our resilience in this accelerating time of change. Buildings are not just shelter. They're key to mitigating and adapting to climate change. And connecting to people in your community is the other key. This is the moment to go all in. As an industry and as citizens, Imagine a city, a city of buildings designed for future climate, a city of people who are connected, active, engaged in their communities. And then imagine that one of those people is you. Thank you. <laughs>